Yeah. 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 Good, we're all good to go. So welcome everybody in the room and we've also got people online via the spotting platform. Um hopefully you're gonna be in for a real treat on an otherwise grey and so, um, yeah, we're going to basically, oh, before I even get to there, housekeeping, otherwise I get shouted at by Amber. So, um, there's no fire drills planned for this afternoon, early evening. If the alarm does go, it's real, and there's basically two exits, you can see where they are. Um, and then the assembly point is, do you know where the Drake Leap, the reservoir is? Basically over there by the cafe, so... Um, but yeah, hopefully we won't have the alarm going off. Um, if you haven't already found them, the loos are at the back. Uh, there's three USX loos, so just, uh, just use them as you, as you need to. Um, courtesy really, phones to silent. Um, we would probably, we'll do a £10 fee if anyone's back. Phone does go off, and then I think Sarah can nominate the charity if we get any donations. So. <laughs> 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 so, no, so welcome everybody. Um, so we've got some people online as well. So as we go through, anybody online, just feel free to ask questions um, at any point. So to get going, really, I just want to give you an introduction. So today's all around assessing your products impact. So looking at um, carbon footprinting of products, but also if you're a service-based business, there's quite a bit of read over. Um, so. Uh, just, I was going to talk a little bit about um, NetZen itself. So that's a sort of successor to a really successful program that Plymouth University did called Low Carbon Devon. And Swimass, I'll tell you about me in a minute. But we worked a lot with Low Carbon Devon, so it's great to see that NetZen's um, got, got the support, is up and running. So um, anything else you want to add there? <laughs> And just to say that Net Zero Exchange is a, a platform uh, and a, um, a project that's bringing together researchers and businesses, hopefully you all can hear me. Um, and yeah, you are joined by coming onto this event, so please explore the platform and see what you can find on there. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, so, what we're going to uh, take you through this afternoon, once we've done the little intro, um, we're then going to set the scene by giving you a bit of a framework from the legal perspective, and I'm really pleased we've got Adam and Sarah from Womble Bond Dickinson. I used to find it a mouthful, but it's, it's getting it's rolling off the tongue now. So, um, so they're going to give us a sort of framework of where we're at in terms of current future legislation, and I think Adam may touch on um, sort of green greenwashing and, the, and the, the sort of danger areas around that. Um, then we're going to have a Q and A after that because it might throw up some some worries, might throw up some concerns. So. The whole point of today is just so we're not packing up the full agenda. So we want loads of time to ask questions and get the best we can from the people in the room, the experts, but also get a good bit of networking going on. Um, take a little short break then, and then I'll be coming back and talking you through um, the theory of product carbon footprinting, which in itself probably could be a week's course. We're going to condense that to about 20, 25 minutes. So. It's going to be fairly high level, but hopefully give you the tools to, to do this for your own products and your own businesses. And then, really pleased, is he here yet? Is it Russ here? Ah, excellent, yeah. Um, so we've got Russ Wakeman from um, Two Drifters Run to actually tell you how they've done it. Um, so right from the horse's mouth, and it's a really interesting case study. You've got some really interesting conclusions that come from it. So, And then we're just going to sort of bring it to a close any final questions, and then I think, I suppose if there's anybody that wants to engage further with the Net Zero Exchange, they can talk to Claire or Amber. Paul, so you're still going to be around? Yeah. Yeah, fine. Um, so yeah, it's going to be fairly informal. Um, so just, I think everybody's happy to take questions as they come up. Um, so with no further ado, I'll hand over to Adam, you first. Sarah's first, okay. Um, very simple, just left and right. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarah Holmes, and I am a legal director at... I'm not quite sure where to stand, actually. To, is that, that I think I'm going to see my notes sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I put, 
Um, so I'm a legal director at Womble Bond Dickinson, which is a transatlantic law firm. I've been specialising in environmental law since 1990, um, and Paul and I have shared various platforms over the year, as, years as we've looked at the development of environmental law, firstly from the 1990s as a point source pollution control focus, and then uh, it's gathered greater scope, and now we're looking at some really quite complex market mechanisms in order to change people's behaviour. So I am going to cover uh, CBAM, which I will explain what that means for those of you who don't know in a moment, um, and Adam is going to deal with um, the legislative framework the claims code and extended producer responsibility at, in the second half of our um, presentation. So the first thing we're going to talk about is carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is uh, EU legislation, and we're going, I'm going to explain how it's going to affect UK exporters to the European Union and what the UK government has in mind if it's um, in power in 2027 um, in terms of introducing the same concept uh, for UK uh, imports. And the philosophy is set out on the slide. I won't repeat too much what's uh, set out here, but it's, it's basically um, an effort to try to capture what is called carbon leakage. So that is when we purchase products from overseas that are very carbon intensive in their production and we don't take that into account in our marketplace. So there's no price attached to those products, which reflects the fact that they've been manufactured in a way that is um, highly carbon intensive and doesn't really uh, provide an incentive, if it's not recognised, um, for people to change the way in which they manufacture. And this is a common approach uh, in EU environmental law of attaching price to a cost to uh, inefficient or polluting uh, techniques in the hope of shifting behaviour uh, to, to drive standards up. So the idea is that um, products that are imported into the European Union or exported from the UK that fall within a category of products that are going to attract this in the first instance um, will have to be uh, the subject of reports by the importers and then from 2026 uh, they, will have, they will have prices attached to them that will have to be um, paid them uh, through the import um, process and that is to, as I say, to encourage um, importers to look at alternatives if there are um, less polluting, less carbon emitting um, products. So <coughs> the goods, I'm going to need my list for here, to avoid making lots of lists on my PowerPoint, so I'll put them on here, not really going to be able to read it from this. One. Okay, so um, before I do the list, um, oh, actually the list is on here, sorry, it's because I can't see um, to read if I wear my glasses and I can't uh, read if I'm wearing my distance, so I can't, yeah, so I need to be able to see. So the six products that are going to be subject to CBAM are uh, cement, iron and steel, aluminium, fertiliser, electricity and hydrogen. Um, and the plan is that um, when CBAM is fully uh, phased in, it will cover around 50% uh, of the emissions that are generated in sectors that are covered by the European Union's emissions trading scheme that we used to be a part of and now we have our own um, emissions trading scheme. Um, but um, the idea is that these are highly carbon intensive sectors and the EU wants to see prices attached to imports of those so that they will be able to be reflected in market price. Um, so initially CBAM is only going to be applicable to raw and simple goods and then in due course, as we've seen with previous EU systems, they'll be expanded to other um, sectors. So, um, again, typical of EU legislation, there's a, a gradual run into the full effect um, of the legislation. So from uh, now, um, 
EU importers are going to need to get familiar with reporting on the carbon intensity of um, the materials that fall within CBAM. As of, and at the moment there are several methods of calculating carbon um, intensity. So um, there's full reporting in accordance with the EU methodology, which I actually couldn't locate. I don't think it's yet been published, um, but there will be an EU published preferred methodology. Um, secondly, there are three equivalent methods at the moment um, that can be used. And then there's a, another, a third alternative, which is only available until July this year, which is report based on default references, uh, ref reference values. Um, but from the 1st of January 2026, there will only be the option, well, there will be no option, all imports must use the um, EU's methodology for calculating carbon intensity. Um, and from the point at which uh, we, 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 when we get to the 1st of January 2026, the importers will have to purchase CBARM certificates, um, which will correspond to the emissions in order to put a price on those emissions. Um, and the price is going to be calculated based on the weekly auction price of the um, European Union's emissions trading scheme and be expressed in, in euros per tonne of carbon dioxide emitted. Um, and what will also happen in the period from 2026 to 2034, for those of you who are familiar with the European Union's emissions trading scheme, is there are free allowances in that which are given to certain sectors um, as part of the, the trading mechanism, those are going to be um, phased out. So um, the certificates will be bought during the year. They don't have to be bought at the point of import, um, but um, they will need to have been acquired before the importer submits their uh, mandatory reports to the relevant authority within the relevant member state. Um, and to avoid double counting, um, there will be provisions to enable uh, account to be taken where the country of origin has already imposed a carbon uh, tax on the manufacture of the products. Um, yeah, so that's that. Okay, so what doesn't CBAR apply to? It's, it doesn't apply to imports from countries uh, that are within the European Union's emissions trading scheme. Um, there is some pressure from some sectors of the UK economy for the UK to align with um, the EU emissions trading scheme uh, in order to, to minimise the barriers to trade that will be and the complexity of, of exporting to the EU. Um, but we won't yet know, I suspect a lot will turn on the outcome of the next general elections to how close uh, our own UK emissions trading scheme looks like that. But um, so all members of the single market are already within the European Union's emissions trading scheme, also linked countries included within to Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Switzerland. Um, and CBAM won't apply as a de minimis threshold to uh, consignments and goods whose value does not exceed 150 euros um, and won't apply to goods used for military activities. So on the next PowerPoint, which I won't go through in detail because you'll have these to look through, um, if you are an importer into the European Union, and I've deliberately presented this so that you can see how we've worked out what you'll have to do if you're an exporter, um, these are the steps um, that the importers will need um, to comply with. So they'll need to see whether the goods they're importing are listed in Annex 1 to the CBAM regulations. Um, they then need to notify uh, their national CBAM competent authority to get registered. Um, and they will upload quarterly reports onto the CBAM uh, competent authority in their own member states register. Um, Obviously, need to notify their exporters from the UK. So, I don't know if anybody here is involved in exporting any of those products to the European Union. 
No, okay, well, I'll be the light touch on the sea round from now on then. Um, but uh, for those businesses that are subject to it, they are going to need to pay close attention um, to the regulations. Um, and then in a mirror image, we've looked at what steps uh, UK exporters will need to comply with. And when I say, well, I've actually put GB exporters up here because, of course, Northern Ireland is in a different position from the rest of uh, the United Kingdom because it's, it is effectively within the single market. Um, and owing to the difficulties over um, power sharing and, and the lack of uh, the Northern Irish um, Assembly sitting, uh, it's quite complicated to work out what's, com what, what is in effect at any particular time. But the default is that it's within the single market and therefore products going from Northern Ireland that don't come from England, Scotland and where or Wales will be within um, CBAM, the EU CBAM. Um, one of the, um, yeah, see, first of all, if you're exporting, you need to look at your embedded emissions and hopefully the importer will be able to guide you through the methodology they're looking for you to use when they account uh, to their um, competent authority. Um, if a carbon price has been paid within the UK, for example, through our own emissions trading scheme, that can be taken into account. Um, and then, um, the, as I said, the European Commission um, is developing its own formula. Um, a consultation was carried out last year um, on uh, in the UK on our own CBAM uh, tool, and the Conservative government has uh, advised it's proposing to implement CBAM in the United Kingdom uh, by 2027. Um, and it's going to continue to consult and have another consultation on the mechanics um, of a UK CBAM. The idea is that there will be some similarities with the EU in that it will apply, uh, a tariff effectively will be applied on imports of emission intensive products based on the embedded emissions um, in the imports. The UK CBAM is proposed to also include ceramics and glass, which the EU CBAM scheme currently doesn't. Um, but the UK CBAM is not proposing to include electricity imports in the CBAM regime. Um, it would be applied to scope one and scope two um, emissions, uh, but not scope three emissions. Um, and there will be um, a, a carve out of um, carbon prices that have been paid in other jurisdictions, so for example, the European Union. Um, well, one area of difference with the European Union is that there won't be any mandatory product standards um, proposed as part of UK CBAM. Uh, the government has indicated in its response to the consultation that it would look at um, voluntary product standards, um, but uh, that's generally not very popular amongst people who are planning to comply because they want everybody to comply and I'll have to say in 30 odd years looking at transposition of EU legislation, the UK's preference for voluntary standards where that, that's been proposed, not generally found in much favour with those regulated. Um, and for those of you not in this room who are looking at uh, CBAM and, and actually complying with CBAM, we've just set out some suggested steps. Uh, to, so that you're in the best possible position to be able to uh, export to the European Union and comply with the UK CBAM when it comes. Right, that's the end of CBAM, and I'm going to hand over now. Quick question yeah, on CBAM. Yes. Is it? I've sort of read that obviously they're starting with the high intensity products. Yes. Yeah. But it sounded very much like they're going to roll it out yes. down through the whole product supply chain. Yeah. So even if you're not affected today, have it on your radar for, and I presume they'll publish some sort of, sort of annex two or whatever it yes. is, when they're going to do the next. Project. Yeah, so the benefit of the EU legislation <coughs> is that because you have member states, multiple member states, 
multiple languages, different ways of doing things in different member states, there's always quite a long lead in time and the Commission publishes proposals that can get consulted on um, and so you do have time to plan and, and to respond to consultations in your own, own country and if you're uh, if you are operating across jurisdictions and not just within the uh, United Kingdom or Great Britain then I'm sure uh, those businesses that are affected with sex will, will be all really engaged. Great. I'm going to hand over to Thank Adam and I'm going to talk about much more interesting uh, directly around <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Hope so. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I've got rather a lot to get through but we'll try and counter as quickly as we can. Um, any questions do just shout. Um, so I'm Adam Richards and I'm currently a solicitor in our planning and infrastructure team at Planning and Dickinson. Um, and I've been more recently getting more heavily involved with SEL on the environmental side of things. So I'm going to cover through the current legislative framework. Um, I'm then also going to run onto Green Claims Code, um, including greenwashing potentially, um, and then the extended producer responsibility. So starting with the legislative framework, um, the consumer protection from unfair trading regulations, as we'll now call the CPRs, um, prohibit traders from misleading consumers by falsely describing their own products. Product, though, um, it's worth noting, is defined very broadly um, and includes goods, services, digital content, immovable property, rights and obligations, um, and also demands for payment. Uh, the CPRs themselves also prohibit traders from hiding information, giving sufficient information, or giving information that's unclear um, in a manner for their products or would mislead the consumer or end customer of your products. The CPRs cover commercial practices, uh, which would include any act, omission, course of conduct, representation or commercial communication, including advertising and marketing. Um, I do get onto the Advertising Standards Agency, BCAP and CAP codes and green claims a little bit in a moment. Um, a trader must not uh, mislead a customer about a product in any way uh, by giving false or deceptive information uh, about a number of specific matters um, and they must also not omit important information about a product that a consumer might need to make a um, informed decision whether they take product A or product B. If a trader does make a false representation that was dishonest um, and by making that representation they intend to make a gain for themselves or somebody else um, or cause a loss to another person then they may even commit uh, an offence under the uh, Fraud Act there, so that's why I've got that on there. Um, and it's a breach of regulations and potentially a criminal offence uh, to engage in an unfair commercial practice. Um, so in relation to a description of a product, a practice will be seen to be unfair um, if it's a misleading uh, action, as mentioned, so it contains a false or misleading information and therefore is untruthful uh, in, in relation to a list of specified matters or its overall presentation or look of the product in any way deceives or is likely to deceive somebody that's purchasing it. Um, a misleading omission, on the other hand, is that it, you omit, so you're taking something off the product um, that should be there, that could cause or is likely to cause a consumer to take a different transactional decision uh, when making that. Uh, so Green Claims Code, you've probably seen some of these little green things on products around town. Um, so if they've got 100% recyclable, green tick, carbon negative, 100% uh, compostable or 100% organic. There are many, many more that I'm sure you'll see around, um, including the famous greenwashing, um, mainly done by airlines in this country at the moment. Um, I think Ryanair got into trouble um, for saying that they were Europe's greenest airline, um, but they then couldn't back it up with any evidence. So the Green Claims Code was introduced by the Competition and Markets Authority. Uh, green claims are sometimes called environmental claims, eco-friendly claims. Um, basically, they're claims that show how your product, uh, service or brand provides a benefit or is less harmful to the environment than their competitors. Green claims can be explicit or implicit. They can appear in advertisements, marketing material, branding, on packaging, uh, um, or any other information that's provided to consumers. Um, just want to note that the International Consumer Protection Enforcement Network Another mouthful there. <laughs> and then they do an annual sweep of websites um, which gives consumer authorities across the world an opportunity to target fraudulent or deceptive or unfair conduct online. Um, and for the first time back in 2021, they made that sweep um, of the internet focused on environmental claims in their entirety. And as part of that sweep, 
members analysed almost 500 websites um, and they found that a staggering 40% of green claims that are made online could be seen as misleading. Uh, Andrea Cus Cuskelli, hopefully that's how you say it, um, of the CMA, um, also said that too many websites appear to be pushing misleading claims onto consumers, which means that companies that do offer products that are genuine environmentally beneficial, um, they're not getting the customers that they deserve. So for a claim to be green, uh, you must have one of the, well, all of these six things that are on the screen. So first of all, it has to be truthful and accurate. So for consumers to make an informed choice about what they buy, the claims must be truthful, accurate, and a claim will be misleading if there's any inaccuracies of impression, even if the claim is factually correct. Businesses must live up to the environmental claims they make. Uh, claims should not imply things that are true if they are not, uh, nor should they overstate or exaggerate the impacts that they have. An example here would be potentially saying that a plastic bottle is 100% recyclable when it isn't. So if the cap isn't recyclable, you couldn't put that on your bottle. Um, and broader terms such as green, sustainable or eco-friendly are much more likely to be inaccurate. So before making a green claim, um, you should ask yourself, is the claim true? Uh, can I live up to the claims I've made on the product? Um, secondly, they have to be clear and unambiguous. So claims should be worded in a way uh, which is transparent and straightforward so that consumers can easily understand them. Uh, in essence, the meaning that the consumers are likely to take from looking at the product, service or goods. Vague and general statements, again, are probably more likely to be misleading. Again, you ask yourself for this question, is the meaning clear to the end consumer? Uh, if it's vague, does the explanation assist that consumer to make the decision? Um, and does it relate to the entire product? Um, or is the information useful or just confusing? Thirdly, you must not omit or hide important information. Um, so what's not said in a claim can also influence the consumer's decision that they make. Uh, customers could be misled by nothing said about an environmental impact of a product. And it's important to think about the whole life cycle of a product, uh, including where the product will eventually end up, i.e. landfill or recycling. So for if you're making a comparison, it must be fair and meaningful. Uh, so if making a comparison, so for example, product A is better than product B for the environment, which is made by product C, then the comparison must be fair and meaningful. Product or service also should meet the same needs and it should be for the same purpose as product as the alternative product. I mean, it's all about allowing the customer to make clear and informed choices um, when they purchase. So the question is there to ask is, it, is, is the claim comparing like for like um, and is the comparison fair and representative? Uh, five, I've already touched on this, but consider the full life cycle of the products um, all from creation to disposal. So customers, as I'm sure you're aware, are becoming more and more aware to product life cycles um, and impacts on the environment that they're making themselves. So it's important that the information be provided where necessary, um, especially electronic goods and where they can be disposed of in a good manner. Um, and then six, so finally, all claims, however small, should be backed up with robust and credible evidence, which is easily accessible to the customer and for you to be able to find out. All information does not need to appear on the packaging itself. Um, the use of QR codes, you see one here, um, is becoming more and more common for things on, like that for recycling on, the, on products. So claims that are genuine when they properly describe the impact they have and they're not hiding any critical or misrepresenting crucial information. So enforcement um, of green claims. Um, so the um, Competition and Markets Authority, the CNA, um, are the UK's primary competition con consumer authority. Um, they share consumer protection law enforcement powers with other bodies, such as trading standards. Um, and again, we'll touch on the CPRs there, um, who are established to enforce consumer protection law in relation to advertising. As I said, you've got the uh, BCAP and CAP codes. So green claims are currently regulated by the sector or product specific requirements, for example, energy efficiency um, and legislation on consumer protection, the CPRs. Uh, the CMA in every case that they investigate will consider carefully who is the appropriate party, uh, whether that's the manufacturer, the wholesaler, or the retailer of the product, uh, and in particular it will be the people or the persons 
who are best to provide redress for what has happened. Consumer protection law covers what businesses say, uh, how they present it, and of course, what they fail to say about environmental credentials of their goods, services, brands, or activities. Um, we do have at the moment the Digital Markets Competition and Consumer Bill passing through. I did check today, it's now on its final reading in the House of Lords, so potentially that could come as an act relatively soon. Um, so the bill um, currently passing through shows that address, addressing greenwashing um, in the UK is a policy priority for the government. Um, and whilst the UK proposal is less ambitious um, than its neighbouring EU directives, um, if it is passed, um, it's going to allow the CMA to enforce and impose fines of up to 10% of annual global turnover for a company. So some pretty big powers there. And it's a bill to provide the regulation of competition in digital markets um, to amend the Competition Act and the Enterprise Act and to make other provisions about competition law um, related to the protection of consumer rights and to confirm other connected purposes. So that's one to keep an eye on. Um, trading standards have got powers under Schedule 5 of the Consumer Rights Act um, and the Competition and Markets Authority also have powers for enforcement. Um, I've popped some enforcement and penalties here, so I'll just run through them quickly. So many breaches of trading standards law are criminal offences um, and they can be prosecuted in the magistrates or Crown Court. And um, a successful prosecution may have a range of consequences, um, including a criminal record, uh, punishment or sentence to an unlimited fine, two years imprisonment, um, and where a business is prosecuted for fraud, fraud, theft, or money laundering, um, in addition to that, um, or instead of um, trading standards offences, you could get up to 14 years imprisonment, um, so it can be very, very serious. You can be ordered to pay compensation, and um, ordered to pay costs of any investigations that the CMA want to make, um, and potentially confiscation of the assets or forfeiture of the goods themselves. Um, you could get a simple caution or a formal warning, um, it's offered as an alternative to prosecution where it's in the public interest to do so and therefore there is no obligation or trading standards to do so but it's at their own um, just, just decision to make. Um, an enforcement order, um, you could apply to the court for an enforcement order but the CMA can apply to the court for an enforcement order um, requiring a business to comply with the law um, and it may include um, the order itself, a breach of the order is a contempt of court which could carry Again, criminal sanctions and a fine or up to two years imprisonment. Um, it could be in order to take enhanced consumer measures, uh, including changes to business processes and paying compensation to victims. In order to pay the costs of the investigation, as I mentioned, um, and a requirement to publicise the order to the public. Uh, you can be granted an undertaking, so an undertaking is a formal way for a business to comply with the law and where appropriate take enhanced consumer measures. Um, or a compliance notice. Uh, is a notice that will require the business to take action to stop doing something um, and in general there'll be a deadline to comply with it in that compliance notice and then if you fail to do so it could lead to more formal action uh, by the CMA in the courts. EPRs, the Extended Producer Responsibility, um, is about making sure that businesses that manufacture, import or sell products are responsible for the end of life environmental impacts, uh, not just when they're made. Um, so the extended producer responsibility for packaging uh, was updated in January this year. Um, packaging fees, will have they been deferred for a year? Um, DEFRA and the Environment Agency will provide an indication of these fees when they can. Um, these will vary on the materials uh, reported. Um, in future, waste management fees will also vary depending on the recyclability of the packaging. So the easier they are to recycle, the more likely the fee will be lower. Um, the regulations will apply to all UK organisations that import or supply packaging. Um, got, you need to collect and report packaging data if the following apply. So they've got, if you're an individual business, have to do a group, not a charity, they're exempt. Um, you've got an annual turnover of a million pound or more based on your most recent accounts. Um, or you were responsible for more than 25 tonnes of packaging imports in 2022. Um, or you carry out any packaging activities. There are small business exemptions, um, but I did just note that, that all coffee shops employing more than 10 people uh, will be required to provide collection points for single use cups uh, from 2025. Uh, da, 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 da. So EPR and packaging, what you may need to do um, is collect and report data, um, pay a waste management fee, pay scheme administrator costs, 
pay a charge to an environmental regulator, uh, get packaging recycling notes or packaging waste expert recycling notes, export, sorry. Um, and what you need to do is based on whether you're classed as a small or larger organisation. Um, your packaging data is to collect is packaging activity, so how the packaging is supplied, packaging types are household and non-household, uh, there's packaging classes that will be involved, so primary, secondary, shipment or tertiary, um, and the packaging material and weight itself. And um, so small organisation um, is, as we mentioned, uh, an annual turnover between one and two million, and supply for more than 25 tonnes of empty packaging to the UK, or an annual turnover is more than a million, or you import more than 25 to 50 tonnes, and a large, you've got annual turnover of two million pounds or more, and you'd be responsible for supplying or importing more than 50 tonnes of empty packaging. Um, the deadlines are laid out in regulations. Um, you should make your best efforts to meet them. So deadlines for reporting packaging for a small organisation at the moment, and you should collect your 2023 packaging data. However, you don't have to report it yet. Um, but you should also collect your 2024 data and submit that by April 2025. Large organisations in England, Scotland and Northern Ireland, you should submit by the 1st of October for a report from January to June 23, and the 1st of April 24, to report for July to December 23. Uh, EPR packaging fees, as mentioned, have been deferred at the moment until October 2025. And well, that is me. Um, any questions or anything like that, we've got our contact leaders. I'm sure slides are going to be shared afterwards as well. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you, Adam. Good question on the packaging yes. one. Is it likely, is it, I mean, it's a sort of crystal ball question, but is it likely that they're going to drop those limits to encompass more and more? I think they will. I businesses. think it's going to be a bit more like the CBAM as well, is yeah. that it will continue to try and you know, capture more in the future. Yeah. Definitely. I think from working with a few businesses, that, that 25 tonnes sounds an awful lot. But if you're shipping stuff on pallets and things like that, I think you get there very quickly. Uh, so, and especially if you're using glass. Um, you get there quite quickly, so it's just another one. What we try to do with this is just sort of give you things that should be on your radar. It may not affect you now, but keep 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 your eye out as your business grows. And okay, thank you. Any other questions? Anything online, Tom? Nothing online yet. No. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Sarah and Adam. We're going to just take a quick five minute break. <coughs> so just recharge your coffee cups. Um, use the facilities and then come back and then I'm going to sort of take you through um, the practical steps of, right, okay, how do we do a carbon footprint on our products? And then I'll also, towards the end of that session, link it back to how do we then label it, how do we communicate it, bearing in mind what we just heard from Adam, that's not making mistakes. Um, and then we're going to, yeah, um, we're going to continue, I uh, sort of us appear <laughs> you battled the floods well done um so yeah so Russ Maitland probably doing the case study from two drifters pulling it all together really and showing you how a business has, has done this how they talk about it how they went about it so yeah quick five minute break um if you want to pick our brains during that break then then by all means so we'll aim to get going again just before sort of 20 past we still on track, haven't we? Yeah, good. <laughs> good. Yeah, just grab a coffee and then, then we'll start again in um, five or six minutes.
It's always a it's always a shame to stop the <laughs> stop the conversation. Sorry. It's, it's, it's that it's that sort of fine line. Do we do we just let the conversations roll? Yeah. Do we keep going? I mean, we we have got quite a bit of um hopefully um a bit of spare time, so so we can certainly pick up the, the networking. Um, just check. It's all we got. No. No questions or anything online? No, we're all good. Okay. So, I'm going to take us through now, similarly to sort of Adam and Sarah, really. And this is a big subject, product carbon footprinting, but I'm going to try and approach it in quite a simplistic way, quite a high level way, but give you the tools and the framework to walk out and at least make a, make a start. So, um, as I said, we've worked with um, Low Carbon Devon and the Net Zero Exchange, and yeah, really yeah, happy to be here, and it's great to see you guys here. In terms of me, um, as Sarah touched on, I go back quite a long way in the environmental and sustainability era. I was chatting to a client yesterday, and it was my first ever visit to a client, and I was not that big, and I was in turn doing an internal audit with the audit with the guy that put the system in on 14,001 and we worked out it was 2003 so it was 20 plus years um, and in those years I mean we're now in a totally different space if we were doing this workshop then we probably would have had two people in the audience at best um, so so yeah so my background is um, manufacturing engineering from a process side I then had the lucky break to get away from manufacturing and get into sustainability um, and I always approach sustainability as that, that sort of three-way thing in terms of product, profit and planet so that it, you can make some decisions which are going to be better for the planet, better for the climate, um, but you always need to make them with a commercial mindset. So, um, so I, that's sort of my approach. I've been working with Swimmers for 15 years, um, and I've, it's really good fun working with Swimmers because almost every three or four years it's like you get a new job. So um, two or three years ago, my new job was to create um, the Make It Net Zero program. So um, since then, we've probably done probably in excess of 250, probably approaching 300 company carbon footprints now. Um, we've done a few um, product ones. So, so yeah, hopefully uh, what I've learned over those years is actually keep it simple. So I'll try and keep it as simple as we can, but don't want to oversimplify it. Um, so if you've got any questions as we go through, just, just, just far away. So what we're going to cover is six steps to creating a, a footprint um, and just take you through those steps nice and slowly. Once you've done your product footprint, you can then go, right, okay, I've got my data, I've got my evidence, um, I can substantiate my claims, then you can start thinking about how you can communicate it. So um, we can look at a couple of ways to do that and we will touch back on um, labelling. I'm then going to leave it at the end, just touching on some useful tools that are out there that you can use um, and leave you with some resources, so some links to some databases where you can get some emissions data. And then just finally touch on the sort of global standards that would cover product footprinting. Um, so really, first bit, and this sort of comes back to me from my manufacturing days and everything, is sort of, before you go and design something, make sure you, you're very clear on the definition. So before you go off and start um, trying to do a product carbon footprint, just stop and make sure you've got the definition right. Um, there's a great quote from Einstein. He sort of, if he's got a problem to solve, he would spend 95% of his time defining what the problem is and then 5% solving it. So it's the same with carbon footprinting for your product. Really be clear of why you're starting. So in terms of why are you doing it? Well, is it is it a legal issue? So what we're seeing in the early signs of CBAM is there's something called an environmental product declaration, which is a way of declaring what the embedded carbon is in your product. And even though it's way ahead of probably CBAM, we're seeing customers asking their suppliers for EPDs. So you may want to do a carbon footprint of your product to comply with that. 
you may want to do it from a marketing point of view, as we will hear hopefully from, from Russ, of some of the benefits of, of promoting your, your, your product as, as sort of more sustainable. Um, you may just want to do it because you're interested. Um, so think about who your audience is going to be as well, because then from the outset, you can decide how you're going to structure the, the carbon footprint. Um, and then lastly, think about how you're going to communicate it. Because if you're doing it from your own point of view and you're not going to go public with it, you don't have to worry about all the legislation out there. So you might just want to do it as an interesting um, internal project. So make sure you've got a real clear goal for your carbon footprint before you start. Adam touched on it um, a little bit in presentation, <coughs> this, this, this thing called um, product life cycle. So when a product gets made, we generally start with some more materials, and in some cases, those raw materials have to be extracted from the earth. So we've got right from getting the raw materials out of the ground. You then probably process their materials, do something to them, change, change them in some way, and then probably hand them to a manufacturer. And then the manufacturer will pick up those materials, start putting them together, and you'll be then starting to build your product. Once you've made your product, you've then got to get it into your hands of your customer. So then you've got to be thinking about the embedded carbon, the impact of distribution. And then, um, I think, it was it excluded from one of the legislations, the product use phase, would you say? Or was it? You, you touched on use, didn't you? But anyway, um, so then you've got to think about um, how, your, how your product's going to be used. And there's a really, when we come on to communication, there's a really interesting um, footprint example of a tea bag and it's, it's quite surprising when you see um, and then lastly about end of life so basically what happens to your product once it's finished it's it's life what happens to it at that point flipping back and sort of opening up a little bit is the other thing in terms of your product is try and move to what we call a circular model so that we don't get to that end of life so that if your product has finished its phase of use can it be remanufactured can it be upgraded so that it goes back into the loop again. But, um, and in terms of setting the boundary, so this is how you're going to wrap your arms around that product lifestyle. There's three sort of common um, boundaries that we see set. The first one is called cradle to gate. So basically you think of cradle as a sort of newborn. So you've, you're taking some newborn materials, you're manufacturing it. And then at the point of manufacture, when it gets to the gate of the factory, that's the end of a cradle to gate um, footprint. You've then got the second term, cradle to gate, but if you're a retailer, so you would wrap your arms around the materials and manufacturing, but because you're retailing it, you pick up carbon in the distribution. And then the last one, really, if you're <coughs> making final products so if you're making final products go straight to a consumer you then get the term where a lot of people know it cradle to grave so that is encompassing the whole life cycle um, and what we see is the complexity does get very complex when you start to go into the in use phase because you've really got to understand how your product is being used by your consumer um, and then end of life is also for a lot of companies, really difficult. So I was working with a really high-end, beautiful sort of furniture a manufacturer. They do beautiful um, curved wooden products, and they don't really have a handle on what's happening to their products at the end of the life. We don't think many of them get there because most people, if it's a beautiful work of art, won't just if it's broke, they won't just bin it. So, so we're having some interesting conversations with them about the end of life. So that's the three sort of boundaries, the common boundaries of, of setting a product footprint. Cool. Hmm. Is there another one that kind of um, cradle to cradle? So that kind of incorporating that circularity, so kind of buybacks and... and, and yeah, and so, yeah. Scheme, yeah. Like yeah, it's a good point, actually. Is cradle to cradle would be the one where you're encompassing that circular model, so that you're, you're looking after that product from its birth back to its rebirth almost. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, then what you've got to do is sort of decide, define the scope of your um, product 
footprint activity. So this is thinking about how far are you going to go in geography? So are you just going to limit it to within the UK? Are you going to do it within the EU? Are you going to have to go for global? Um, what sort of time frame are you going to um, pick? Most of the time it's sort of, um, if you're doing a company carbon footprint, it's typically a year. But for a product carbon footprint, it may be longer because of the, the whole um, life cycle. Um, are you going to set some exclusions straight away? So typically you can, you can exclude things if they're going to be very complicated to find the data or um, maybe the data just doesn't exist. Quite often companies have to make assumptions. So what you need to do is making sure that you're documenting this because if you're then going to claim on your product, you need to be bound to go back it up. So if you've got a clear defined scope where you've made some assumptions, you've set some exclusions, nobody can point the finger at you. Then start to think about sort of data requirements and we're going we're gonna to just spend a little bit more time on data requirements. Um, because it's the big chunk of, of doing a product footprint. And then we're also going to touch on something called allocation. So some bits of data, you're not going to have 100% of all that emission. You may have to allocate it either with another customer or another manufacturer. So we're just going to talk about how that works. Um, you've then got these two terms, really. It's sort of like you need to be doing the carbon footprint based on a thing. So a thing can either be what's called a declared unit, so that's the easier one, so that's something very tangible. It could be carbon per kilogram of product, could be carbon per meter squared of a carpet tile, could be carbon per distance travelled, but that's a tangible unit of measure that's very, very clear. Um, the functional unit is a little bit um, I struggled with it at the start, but, but sort of basically it's, a, it's for a final product. So you're thinking about function. So it would be a carbon footprint of a car, carbon footprint of a vacuum cleaner. So it's the whole thing rather than a carbon footprint of five kilograms of vacuum cleaner. It's the, it's the entirety of it. So, um, so that's the two sort of um, terminologies to, to be thinking about how you're going to approach it. So I'm just sort of picking on Ian. Essential oils probably going to be volume related. So um, run probably volume again. Um, functional unit. Functional unit. Ah, okay. Bottle of rum. <laughs> Bottle of rum. Yeah. Like you say. So so yeah. So it's just making that decision point. So you're very clear about what you're doing. Then you need to build what call the what we call this, the data inventory. So this is your list of all the things of where there are emissions from your product. So, so you need to be thinking right from the word go, the type of data. So you can have site specific. So in my factory, I can measure things, I can record things. Um, if you can't measure and record them straight away, you then may move to what you call secondary data. So that sort of might be um, something on an invoice. So pounds weight you've bought something but you haven't physically measured it so primary is your physically gathering it gathering it secondary you've got it from a secondary source and then you can get something called proxy so this is where you're using average data that's the basic sum normally from an academic facility there's someone's worked out the average carbon in that in that thing so that's your sort of three main types of data then you've got to think about where you're going to get your data from so you end up this inventory is like a table so what is the data? Where are you going to get the data from? Is it going to be from accounts? Is it going to be from purchasing, logistics department? Be really clear about your unit of measure, so that because you're going to be doing calculations later on. So if we don't not clear on the unit of measure, your calculations are going to be wildly out. I had a client with that the other day, um, transferring millions into thousands, and their footprint was like, well, literally a million times bigger than it should have been. So. Um, Data quality, so we're going to talk about that in a little bit more, but basically thinking about, okay, not every time you're going to be able to get primary data. So just think about the data you've got, how, how good is it, how reliable is it, how repeatable is it, um, is it technologically sort of sound, is it from the right time frame, and is it from the right geographic area. So when you start thinking about logistics, there'll be emissions data for UK logistics, there'll be emissions data from EU countries, there'll be um, 
world emissions data. So you just need to think about your geographic nature of your data. And then it's really important, I mean, I come from a manufacturing, from a lean background, so continual improvement is a big thing of, of lean manufacturing. With your product carbon foot in your first pass, it's probably not going to be perfect. So in, in your data inventory, just think about how you might improve that data element for next year. So the um, reason why this is all coming, slipping off the tongue is we've got Kurush in the audience, who's, who's joined SwimAss as our knowledge transfer um, partner. And he's working for the university with us on a two-year programme, doing scope three framework tools, but also product carbon footprinting. So, um, so Kurosh helped me sort of pull the slides together and everything. And it's, yeah, it's really interesting, his early work on scope three, there's a big area around data quality, because that's where we see um, a lot of companies making some, some difficult decisions and quite sometimes some wrong decisions. So once you've, you've got your data inventory, then it's the fun bit, if you're an accountant. Or if you're if you're minded that way, <laughs> I I couldn't do this bit. So basically, you're just going to now go down your data inventory and go collect that data. Go find it. So, um, but hopefully now, because your inventory has pointed you in the right place, you know the unit measure and you know where you get it from. It should be it should be fairly fairly simple. But it will take an awful long time. I mean, it'd be interesting to see what Russ says about how how long it took them to do it. But um, yeah, also. Bear in mind, if you're then talking to your supply chain, you've got another dimension of time and complexity, but, but don't be put off by it, just, just follow your, your data inventory. We said about sort of data collection and, and quality, really. This is a, a good sort of rule of thumb, really. The sort of lowest of the low is an approximated, a proxy data times by a um, sort of uh, an emissions factor. The next sort of tick up would be something measured, but you're then still using assumed um, uh, consumption rate and the emission factor. Next one up is you've actually measured it, done some sampling. Next one up is you've actually physically measured it, and then the last one is you've you've sort of, you've, you've you've really taken that measurement precisely. Um, so so think about that as you're as you're doing your your product footprint. Keeping up with me? Are we all right? And then in terms of data quality, because it's you've probably heard the term garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't get the data right, the whole footprint's flawed anyway. So in terms of data quality, this is the other area you should be thinking about. It is sort of like, is it clean data? So are there any errors in it? Um, is it all complete? So on your inventory, have you got every single line item, or have you got some missing? Um, is it comprehensive? Um, is it what you chose at the start, and is there anything confusing about it? So basically what you're doing is after you've gathered the data, you're going to use this sort of decision tree to go back down your inventory and just sort of just cross-check it, really. Um, and just make sure that it's sort of credible, as we heard. It's got, you may be asked to produce it, so it's got to sort of stand up in... Hopefully not caught, but um, if you're if you're asked by a customer. So then you've then got all your data. So you've got all your units of measure, you know how many things that you've got on your data inventory. We've now got to turn that into carbon, because that's the whole point of this is, is turning it into a product carbon footprint. So you've then got to go off and find the emissions factor. So a kilo of aluminium would equal so many kilos of carbon. A kilo of um, gold will, will have a different mechanism, a uh, different emissions factor. So, so there are um, publicly available emissions databases, but there are also commercial ones as well. And so we're gonna give you one example of a commercial company who they've got access to, I think, something like 50 different databases. So they can accelerate your product carbon footprint quite quick, but obviously you're paying a commercial fee for that. So, so these are two quite um, sort of common ones. You've got the EFTB one, and then you've got the, the good old UK um, government one, which will come from the GHG greenhouse gas protocol um, database. So, so yeah, find your data, and then so yeah, just on that. So then what you've got, you add that to the end of your column. 
and then you can start doing the maths. So basically, you're now gonna, gonna start computing carbon, but not everything that you compute, you won't have it as an entirety. So, so a good example of allocation would be, you're trying to work out the logistics of this, how this mouse pointer got to um, PC World. It came on a DPD lorry, but on that lorry was another 200 packages. So of the one ton of carbon that that lorry consumed, right, transiting around the UK, how much do I allocate for my mouse pointer? So, so if you're gonna do allocations, basically put it in red, um, you want to avoid it wherever possible because it's sort of, it's, it's, it's prone to quite large errors. So, so basically, if you're gonna do it, you need to be thinking about what the method is um, so you might do it, the DPD example, you might do it on weight, would be a good one to do with logistics. Um, quite common, you do it on the amount you buy. So if you're talking to a supplier and it's a bit vague what the total carbon footprint of the materials you buy or the products you buy from them, another allocation method would be, I spend a million pound with you a year, you're a 10 million pound business, Therefore, I will take 10% of your overall emissions and roll that into my product. So that would be another way of um, doing emissions allocation. Um, but make sure it's sort of relevant. So if cost is relevant, weight is relevant. Um, sometimes it's time, things like that. But, but be wary on, on using um, allocations unless you really have to. Then what you want to do is don't just press the button and then tell the world. You need to basically cross-check cross-check your figures. So, so really go back through it with a fine tooth comb, checking your data, checking there's no anomalies. Um, so I had a client yesterday and they were doing the, the company carbon footprint and they were three years in. So they said, oh, can you update our report? And I said, yes, of course. Can, can you send me your data for 22, 23 and your data for 23, 24? Yes, here, here you are. I put it all in. And it's really interesting, the carbon was just a flat line. From, and I was like, that's really strange. So then I looked at the data, and it was identical to the first year they'd given me. So I got in contact with the client, and bless her, she said, oh, there's nothing changing in the company. So the electricity got me the same, and the gas, and the fuel. <laughs> so, so they just made an assumption that nothing had changed in the business, therefore the data's all the same. So you can't do that. You have to um, basically check it's, it's valid. Once you've done your data, quite often you can start drawing some conclusions. So when you do your footprint and you look at this big long inventory, there's going to be two or three things that have got the lion's share of your carbon. And I know Russ is going <laughs> to going to illustrate that <laughs> bang on in a bit. Um, so so already you can see where your carbon hotspots are in your product. So use that data to draw some conclusions, and then make some recommendations really. So, so if you're doing this, and it's the same as if you're doing a company carbon footprint, I don't think you should do a product footprint and just go, it's 10 tonnes per kilo or it's 10 tonnes per pound. It's about what you're going to do to reduce that. Because otherwise, if we just measure it and do nothing, you've not really gained a lot. So, so make sure that you can pull some conclusions out and then make some recommendations. And then it's time to share the results in a legally compliant way, of course. <laughs> so... Um, two examples, sorry the image on the right is a bit fuzzy. So this is, I said we would sort of talk about some of the commercial products. So this is a product called One Click LCA. And they've honed in on lots of businesses need to do product carbon footprints. So they've built an IT platform to basically do it. Very quick, they've got access to a whole host of databases. This is another company, Pucketees. So I don't know if it's clear enough from the back, but in terms of the product footprint of the product, where's the biggest emissions? Use space? Yes. So, because to make a cup of tea, you've got to boil the cow. So, interestingly now, their packaging informs the consumer only boil enough water for your cup of tea. Um, so, they've, 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 they can't do much about that. You can't make tea with cold water but they're now sort of informing the consumer of what they can do. Um, I like Packer's way of doing it because that's very engaging. I want to read that, I want to get involved. That's okay, there's nice imagery, um, but 
there's some pretty bad examples of communicating it to your customers out there. Then we said about labeling. So um, there is a lot of different labeling schemes out there. Um, probably the most common one and the one that's got most traction is from the Carbon Trust. Um, so that's what I'm seeing quite often. It's really sad, this sort of job. You, and hopefully well, you will, we'll, we'll do it now because I've told you. When you're next in the supermarket, you start turning the products over and you'll see some of these labels on the back. So, um, so that's two examples of a carbon label. So this is where you need to be sure it's very clear, and very evidence-based. So they're saying what, what the actual carbon is in that T-shirt. Um, and each part is its life phase, which is, which is quite nice. Um, as I said, there's loads of different carbon labeling going on. And it's, I think this is where the Greens Claim Code has, has sort of had to step in because, because people were just saying all sorts um, and misleading consumers. Um, so yeah, so choose your, I think choose your own. If you're gonna, gonna, gonna use labeling, choose your, your labeling scheme wisely and make sure it's, um, so it's, so it's valid. I then said I'd finish off, I think we're doing all right for time. I was gonna finish off talking, just give you some resources and tools. So these slides are going up on PDF, aren't they? So yeah, so all the hyperlinks should work. So in terms of the tools, and this is just a small selection, they could have been slide after slide after slide. So you've got one click LCA, Umberto, um, carbonfootprint.com, they were fairly early, early sort of pioneers and they've got a lot of great tools out there. If you're really brave, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol website is a great source of resource, but um, you've, got to, you've got to be prepared to understand it, wade through it. Um, but it's free and it's it's kept up to date every single year. So, and then you've got a whole host of um, product carbon calculators starting to emerge. So, and then hopefully, if Kurosh does well in, in two years, well, eighteen months probably, we should have a swim mass carbon footprint tool. We're, we're fairly sure. Um, and then emissions databases. So this is where you get your your magical emissions figures. So you've got um, the GHG, Greenhouse Gas Protocol. They do life cycle databases and they're very thorough. You've got them the IPCC. They do another um, database and then there's another um, one through OpenLCA. Um, and also if you do, if you are lucky enough to be working with an academic facility, I think most academic facilities have got extended um, databases themselves. So, so the last bit really is, and this is just this is just either your choice or you may be forced to, to choose a, a globally recognized standard. So, so there are two um, standards that are, that are um, out there. So there's the ISO standard 1467, and you've then got the PAS 2050 um, standard. So depending on, remember we go right back to the goal, Lending why we're doing this, if it's to um, sort of uh, tell a customer what, what they need to know, they may ask you to do it to an accredited um, standard. So these standards mean you can go and get a third party auditor to check your work against the main standard and then put stick it on the wall and on your product and it will hold all its, um, all its, all its um, weight in court if, it, if you ever got that far. So, so that is where I was going to finish. Obviously, that was probably about half an hour on a very complicated um, subject, but I want to make sure we've got more and more than enough time for Russ, because that I think will bring it all together and, and, and bring it to life. So, any questions? Oh. Yeah, no. It won't be a hard for them. And the data collected, for example, with essential oils, yeah. The, if you wanted to get what the carbon emission cost of a server liter of lavender oil, yeah, in the production of that, is that something you could just get off a company or the net, or do you have to actually calculate that yourself? I, for something like essential oils from lavender, would be very specialist. So I doubt that would be on any emissions um, database. So, and then the second part, that question, if it was, there's 
for example, most of it comes from Bulgaria, so it would be based on their processing. Ours is far more efficient, so should we do our own? And that's why it comes back to that geographic point. So if you're doing it on your product, I would suggest you probably do it on your processes and UK figures. Mm. Um, so, so a bit like I didn't cover was when you're trying to do this, it's really good to get a process map drawn out of your the process that your product goes through and, it, and its creation, because then you can really understand the steps. So I think you're going to probably have to do it yourself. Um, unfortunately, there'll be some there'll be some emissions taken. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Oh, it really was just how reliable was it? It was there. Yeah. How reliable? Was it? We, we, we see the data, we see this even with company carbon footprints. So if you are trying to work out carbon associated with your electricity, you've got two emissions factors. One is for 100% green. And the other emission factor is for what they call brown or standard energy, standard electricity. But each energy supplier supplies different fuel mixes. So even that it's a bit misleading in, in some instances. So I think you just have to get what you can, document what you got, document any assumptions, and, and just improve it as you can. Any more before I pass on to, do you want an introduction, Ross, or are you going to introduce no, 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 yourself? No, 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 no. <laughs> Good. And a big thank you to Russ for the other, bit of a challenging <laughs> trip, as did Kurosh on the trains, because. We're here talking about carbon, and today we've got the, the impact of climate change with floods causing a bit of mayhem on the transport network. So, so thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, it's um, it's just this. Yep. Back and forth. Easy. <laughs> Hello, I'm Russ. Yes, I battled the floods and got here. This has been a great setup, and it's very rare that I get to give a talk where I've seen the legal aspects and got worried about what we're doing, whether it's right, and then someone explain exactly how you do a carbon footprint and a life cycle assessment so that some of my slides I can gloss over because you've covered uh, large parts of it. So that's great, that very rarely happens. Um, I am one of the two drifters, so we're a husband and wife team. My wife is, of course, the other drifter, Gemma. Um, and we are a rum distillery. We produce rum from scratch uh, in Exeter, just by Exeter Airport. And uh, I want to tell you a bit about the rum, what we make. I'm sorry I brought no samples on the show. <laughs> just cover that off. But uh, yeah, I want to talk about that and also a little bit about our carbon footprint, of course, and how we achieve a carbon negative rum in the first place. So who are we? Well, yeah, like I said, Gemma and I, uh, both set up two drifters back in 2019, maybe seven months before the pandemic, which has been obviously an interesting challenge in the hospitality world. Um, but you know, we're still here five years on nearly. Um, we have a, a brewery set up. So our, uh, our warehouse that we have uh, by Extra Airport is kind of an aircraft hangar shape, um, stupid building, pointed roof, sloped walls, no one wanted it. So we were very happy to move in there but we bought a brewery on the basis that we've never made rum before. So Gemma's background is medical sales. She's a medical sales rep. And my background's chemistry. So uh, my research I'll come on to when we talk about the carbon stuff, was, but it was involved mainly in carbon capture, carbon storage, and trying to turn CO2 into anything of value. But I was an organic chemist, so distilling was kind of the day job. This is just a much bigger scale way of distilling. So. We both uh, sold our house, uh, invested in the business, all the money into the business, so it was all cards in, moved back to Devon because we were in Swansea at the time, doing, I was doing a fellowship there, uh, and we thought, right, we're going to make rum, but we've never made rum before, we have made beer, we should probably hedge our bets and have a brewery and a little rum distillery on the side so we can get a bit better at making it. Uh, that lasted maybe three months of making beer. Then we quickly converted all of the brewery equipment to make as much rum as possible. And we went from an initial 80 bottles of rum a week we could produce to now we've got our fully converted brewery. And I say fully converted, this is just a kettle uh, with a copper condenser on the top. That is the level of conversion that's required. Um, but that took us to two and a half thousand bottles a week. So that's kind of where we sit now. Here's a better picture of the distillery. So this is all the shiny stainless steel equipment. Um, and these are our fermenters. Um, we ferment molasses, 
we then distill it twice and a third time for our white rum and we produce all of our products uh, in this as you can see the silly slope roof here uh, and the copper condenser that sits just just on top of here and then the second distillation takes place on our um, smaller you know this sort of size um, stills which are uh, copper tops they're all stainless steel and they're all fully electric okay the rum very important Glad you mentioned that earlier, <laughs> that uh, it's not just about the carbon footprint, it very much has to have a commercial spin, because the most important thing, and I always talk about it uh, first, is the rum. The rum is the most important thing that we do, right? Without it, there is no business, and having a carbon negative footprint and all the other work that I'm going to talk about is irrelevant if you have a crap product. <laughs> you have to have something people want to come back and buy and drink and enjoy, uh, in order to make it work. So, most importantly, here is our rum. We produce four different varieties. The white rum is our flagship product. White rum is a very difficult thing to sell to people because it has cheap, nasty connotations, Bacardi, paint stripper, I hear all sorts of things. But it's the very hardest to get right as a rum distiller because white rum has nothing but water added and you are completely exposed to the process of producing it, which means a good white rum means a good distillery. Right? It's the best one to benchmark a distillery against. You can cover up all multitude of sins with spices, casks, anything else. But to have a nice pure white rum that you've just added water to, that's tough. So the white rum is, is, is the best. You're not allowed a favourite child, but it's ours. Um, then we produce, uh, we, we take some of our rum and put it into uh, ex-Madeira casks. So emptied of Madeira, gives a lovely burnt orange uh, quality to the to the rum, nice 12 months aging, uh, and that's uh, our signature rum. And then we have our two spice drums, so a lightly spiced rum. These, these three are all 40% ABV. It's lightly spiced with uh, a mix of spices that sits on star anise flowers. So it has a very nice uh, quality that goes very well with ginger beer. The final rum is our overproof spiced pineapple. This is our expression of fun. Overproof, so bottled at 60% ABV, very strong, punchy. This is the only one we add sugar to, so it's a nice, sweet, full, I mean, it's a full-on taste. It's, uh, it, it's, yeah, it needs to be tried. Here it is as a, uh, a vegan pina colada made with oat milk. Uh, absolutely delicious. Quality speaks for itself. You know, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've been uh, awarded. We've won a few awards for the quality of our rum, but, uh, yeah, great taste. Two stars for the pineapple was a nice accolade for us to pick up. Rum's a really interesting category. Uh, the UK is actually the third biggest rum consumer in the world, um, sitting behind the US and India. And uh, that means we're in a great, exciting environment uh, where we can sell lots of products, hopefully. Half of that rum is Bacardi. So there's a lot of market share to try and steal. And rum is always thought of as <laughs> a cheap spirit. Um, it is always pushed on price rather than and volume rather than quality so um, there is a big opportunity for the premiumization that has been seen in other spirits categories so it's why it's an interesting space to be in this is more of an investor slide than for you guys but <laughs> these are some of our partners so uh, the latest ones and the big highlights on here certainly when we're thinking about carbon footprint is and use space particularly uh, is our airline and the easyjet one is actually not announced yet so uh, I know you're sharing the slides, but <laughs> 20th of March, we go live with EasyJet. We've been with British Airways for a year. So our rum is the miniature uh, on British Airways. It's the signature one, the one in the cask. EasyJet are choosing the white rum as a premium offering versus the Cardi. It's a big statement for us and a big uh, master. These are the other kind of, uh, it's interesting to see. And the <laughs> last thing I'll highlight is that these are guilty <laughs> industries that we sell to right so if you have a carbon intensive industry steak restaurant airlines they do everything they can to try and reduce their footprint in other areas and so choosing us is a natural thing um, okay the airline one is a really interesting one and one i'm going to hone in on because it uh, relates to our life cycle assessment but also how you package things up these are the latest developments so the miniatures are aluminium so very much lightweight, uh, and I'll come on to a lot of that, but it has a big impact on your use phase when you're thinking about flying your product around. Okay, why we're here. Why carbon negative? What is carbon negative? 
Um, why go that far? Uh, can you claim it? Is it legal? We have to think about what we just heard, a life cycle assessment. My slide, of course, is circular because we like to think that is achievable at some point, although very difficult in lots of areas. But it's exactly the same thing we just saw in the last talk. So moving from raw materials and the cradle right the way through to the grave or back to the cradle again. And you have to think about what's the impact of producing rum and who drinks it and where it's drunk, how it's drunk, uh, and also how it gets to people. So, yeah, we have the same approach you just saw. In terms of the CO2 emissions tied up in making the rum, you've got to think on uh, the level of detail. Now, I know that you understand the process because you've just seen the same talk, but uh, the sugar is an excellent one to focus in on using that kind of understanding of the geography of where things come from and also the processes and how we uh, take it to, to kind of the next level in terms of the drinks industry, right? So we are the first producer to publish an EPD on a drinks uh, product, right? So we have an EPD published on our website please have a look. Um, it's very long, very detailed, but it does contain uh, lots of snippets of goodness. But if we think about the sugar and its process and how it gets to us and all the things that are tied up, because you may be thinking, why did he choose rum in the UK <laughs> when plenty of people in the Caribbean near where the sugar's produced, uh, you know, they, they produce very good quality product. And it's kind of a deliberate act. You'll see how we've set up the business model to think about the carbon footprint that we've caused uh, and how that ties in. But rum is for two reasons. One is it's difficult to have that as carbon negative product, um, especially when you're producing in the UK and sugar does not grow anywhere near here. Second, Gemma and I absolutely love rum. So it was always gonna be that way. Our first date was rum tasting. We went to St. Lucia on our honeymoon. It's been a constant problem theme through our marriage. So <laughs> here we are. Sugar obviously starts in the sugarcane plantations. You've got all the emissions associated with your fertilizer, your pesticides, your seed production, the farm machinery that's running around is burning diesel the whole time. You know, you've got all of that. Then you've got to harvest your cane and produce your raw sugar, which is a milling process, very energy intensive. All of those emissions have started, right? And our assumption on geography is the very worst. We take the worst um, scenario. And we say, right, it's, gone, it's come from Brazil. This is as bad as we think we can get it. All we know from our actual supply chain is that the molasses comes from either Algeria or Morocco. And then trying to find out where that actual molasses, because molasses is, of course, a waste byproduct of processing the sugar. So you don't know where the sugar grew in the first place when you're just buying this product here in the UK. So we buy it from Portbury in Bristol. Um, tracing that back through, it's a murky world of sugar. They, they don't want to give up much information. So therefore we make the worst case assumption. So that sugar cane we assume grows in Brazil and our data is based on all of that. Then you've got your transportation. Okay, so it's in Brazil, it's gone from plantation to mill. Uh, it's gone from the mill where it's, uh, it's turned into that raw sugar. Uh, by sea to the refinery, the refinery is where it'll be turned into the nice white granulated sugar, that's the, you know, the prized commodity, and the waste left over that's the molasses, which is what we use. Like I said, that refinery is in Algeria or Morocco. So pick the furthest, we'll go for Algeria from Brazil, and we'll say, right, that's where our refinery is, and then we use the data for that to say, right, this is, this is how the refining process taking place. You've got a big sea journey across, so there's a lot of emissions tied up there. Then it gets uh, refined, and obviously the molasses then put on a boat and comes to uh, it comes to the UK, Portbury, like I said, where huge shipments of molasses are brought in. Molasses is almost exclusively brought to the UK as cattle feed, right? So it's here predominantly to feed dairy cows. We buy it by the five tons, and so the final part of the journey in terms of the molasses is to come down the M5, uh, in a big lorry, and then he just pumps it straight into our containers in the distillery. And so before we've even produced a single bottle of rum, all of that impact has been caused, right? So that we're responsible for it, hence why we include it. The refining, obviously we're worried about the energy and all the water use. That boat journey is a, an enormous contribution. That is a big, big hotspot. And if I could command enough <laughs> sales of rum bottles to commandeer a sailing vessel <laughs> to bring it 
If I sail across, I would, um, but it's just not possible uh, price-wise, so that's where we are. Uh, the molasses, this is the sort of lorry that they bring down, um, and he just pumps it into the distillery. Okay, so it's arrived at the distillery. We've now got to turn that molasses into uh, our rum, and the first part of that process is the fermentation. So here you've got an opportunity to try and capture some of the carbon. And so one of the experiments that we've been trying to do, uh, and I have been kind of succeeding, is to take the CO2 from the fermentation. So I, I'm assuming some knowledge of fermentation, but basically sugar gets chopped up into ethanol and CO2 gets released as a byproduct, right? That's kind of an oversimplified version, but that's what you get. That CO2 that comes out is what the plant took in to grow, right? So it's a, it's a neutral process. So if you can capture any of the CO2 that comes off from the fermentation, you've got an easy win if you can put it into something else. And if you can permanently store it underground, you could achieve negativity just from doing that. What we're trying to do at the moment through some experiments is just to, to enhance the growth of strawberries in a kind of hydroponic setup. Uh, that basically you can get 30% more strawberries if you feed it the right level of CO2, right? So it's an extra use of our CO2, so it's just a little uh, side bit. And there, there are other things you could do. Algae is the bigger play, uh, and growing protein, spirulina, say, uh, from our waste CO2 from the fermenters would be a really interesting step, but it's expensive. Okay, then the final step for us in terms of the molasses and the sugar journey is to transport the waste out to a farmer. And actually I had a really interesting guy come and visit me on Monday who has black soldier flies. And what he does is they feed off waste and they are the biggest bioaccumulators. I've never heard all of this, <laughs> but they basically can eat, what was the stat he gave? A kilo of uh, fly larvae, right? In, in a load of waste will turn into five and a half tons of maggots. And then those five, and it's lovely, so those five and a half tons are then blitzed into protein, and that protein is added to uh, pet food. And it's a supplement also for um, fish farming, right? So instead of grinding up fish, you can use these maggots to do it. But it goes from a kilo, consumes all of our waste, and produces five and a half tons of, uh, <laughs> I mean, mind blowing, that kind of level of bioaccumulation. So it's another thing you can do. For now, we've taken to the farmer, and he feeds it to his cattle. So really all we've done is buy cattle feed, sneak out rum, and produce cattle feed. <laughs> okay, the electric distillery. So this is critical to what we can achieve. Those are all the things I can't do anything about that sugar journey, right? I can't influence it. I told you our scale of commercial sales, our rate of sales is not enough for me to command a sailing vessel. Things I can control is the fully electric distillery and to choose to use SSE's green tariff in order to produce very, very low emissions, just the transmission, uh, in terms of the production of our, our products, so we can control that. Other things we do around the distillery are uh, electric vehicles that we do the local deliveries in, and DPD is a good example. They smash loads and loads of bottles, but you know we still stick <laughs> with them because they're carbon neutral. <laughs> Commitment is better than most, um, so we live with that. But these are things that we can do in terms of getting into the consumer and so on. There are lots of things I can't do anything about, one of which is if we send pallets somewhere, there is no DVD equivalent carbon neutral uh, committed hauler, presumably because it just costs too much. So we have to think about what we're gonna do about it. So what are you gonna do about the carbon you haven't got? Well, back to my chemistry days, uh, I worked in this carbon catcher environment. Nice picture of carbon catcher, if only it was so simple. Um, why is it difficult to capture carbon directly? So direct air capture is the bit that really excites me. Why is it difficult? Well, uh, of the air atmospheric competition, and there is a test later, I hope you're all making notes, <laughs> it's enough writing, but anyway, the, the, the carbon dioxide is a large part of the trace gases. It's actually only 400 parts per million, which is a lot compared to what we used to have as a planet, but it's still very, very small. So it's a bit like trying to grab one drop from an Olympic sized swimming pool. That's the kind of challenge you've got of capturing carbon. So that's why it's difficult. How do we do it? Well, we work with a partner that, uh, that has a direct air capture technology. So uh, Climeworks, they're, they're a Swiss company. They're based in, uh, in Zurich, but the plant itself, so these direct air capture machines, you know, they look a little bit like air conditioning units, but they're not. 
they are essentially sucking CO2 straight out of the atmosphere. So what happens is the air passes through and all the CO2 gets stuck on the filter and CO2 free air comes out the other side. So that's what direct air capture is. This offers a way to remove the CO2 you can't avoid, right? So then the challenge becomes calculate all of the CO2 emissions tied up in producing a bottle of your product, hence the functional unit, and say, right, we're going to suck out all of the CO2 uh, that we can't avoid, as well as all the stuff, uh, everything tied up in the body, so the full life cycle of the product. Um, this little bit is just to show the difference in terms of impact that direct air capture has versus other technologies. Now, the critical thing uh, that relates to what we're talking about here is the verifiable nature of the carbon removal. So here we have a process that captures CO2. It then goes through a secondary process, which is called by a company called CarbFix, where it's injected back underground and solidified as in, in volcanic rock. So as in basalt rock, it solidifies and is permanently locked away, right? So just injected in, gone, mineralized. It takes about 18 months for that process to happen. So what you have here is a way of sucking CO2 from the atmosphere and permanently storing it underground. And it's measurable and it's third party verified and you can quantify it exactly because you can say, right, there's that many grams of basalt rock that's now solidified and I want that many grams of CO2 removed. That's how it works. Then the challenge is, of course, to verify your calculation, your life cycle assessment, and to say, and to make the balance work. And that's been the challenge uh, as a distillery. We have removed uh, <clears throat> carbon dioxide in this plant. So this, they're based in Iceland, uh, like I said. The reason it's in Iceland is you have the geothermal energy and the large abundance of heat that's required for the phase of catching the CO2 happens on essentially a sponge and the way to squeeze out the sponge is to heat it up. If you have to use fossil fuels to heat it up, then why did you do it in the first place? So the geothermal energy offers a way. Also offers a way back down into the basalt rock because that's where the geothermal energy comes from. And so they just have a pipe that goes the other way, injecting it underground. So that's how the carbon removal side works. Then we've got to think about, right, now we know exactly how much CO2 we've caused and how much uh, carbon we need to remove. And we've got climax who can do it. Why doesn't everyone do that? That's a very good question. It's exceedingly expensive climax technology. I mean, just look at it. <laughs> Right? This doesn't look like a cheap operation. I showed you how hard it was to capture carbon uh, in that way. So it's, it's really not a very simple process at all. And the price, if we're talking about the, uh, the European system, it's, it's, uh, the, the tariff is around 80 euros a ton um, for CO2. You know, it moves all the time, but it's around there. The price to remove it with Climeworks is 1,000 euros a ton. Right? So there's no real business incentive to do it. It doesn't make sense at all. We price it in to our products. And so we think of it as a built-in carbon tax that says, right, you commit to removing the carbon that you can't avoid. How are you going to avoid it so you don't have to pay so much? And there it drives us to work very hard to reduce the carbon footprint as much as possible. What's the least carbon intensive version here that's not damaging the planet just for the sake of it? So I've got a couple of examples I want to rattle through because I've got no idea how I'm doing the time. But um, could it go more few minutes? All right, it's easy. Loads of questions. <laughs> so uh, on the glass bottles, glass bottles are maybe a third of the contribution of the carbon footprint of the entire product, right? And another third is the sugar. So that's why I use it as an example. But in terms of glass bottles, uh, when you start uh, a rum distillery, if you're ever thinking about it, you probably, probably think you need heavy, really nice, solid bottles that make you feel like you're buying something premium. You know, we charge £35 a bottle, so it's not a cheap product. You don't just grab it off the shelf and you, walk and you think, yeah, it's great. So you start thinking, yeah, let's have a nice heavy bottle, nice thick bottom glass. It's obviously stupid in hindsight, but hindsight is very easy. These are our old bottles here. They were 744 grams of glass, right? Nothing in it, just 744 grams of glass. They were produced in Italy. We discovered, following the path of where they came from, that they go from Italy to Slovenia, Slovenia to France, France to the UK, central distribution out to customs. Right, that's the path your glass takes. And then you're shipping 744 grams, all of that distance, for what reason? 
is there a better way? So you can, you can find out the carbon equivalents uh, of what the glass manufacturing is based on uh, an Italian glass, very well covered off in terms of data. And the transport, we used exactly that, the, the um, UK greenhouse gas uh, conversion rates and that tell you exactly what the emissions are for an average lorry. So there you can work out the emissions of 862 grams of CO2 just to get that bottle to the distillery. That's quite a lot. So <clears throat> first option is to reduce the weight of the glass. So when we rebranded in 2021, we, uh, we were like, right, let's think. And the, the brief to the branding guys was, how can we make it more sustainable and look awesome and you know sell loads and loads of products? Because that's what we want to do, dominate the world with rum. And they kind of had the brief of, okay, well, let's make it look pretty, which they did. I think they did a wonderful job. Um, but also, these are very bartender friendly. These are nice tall bottles. They fit in people's uh, speed rails, you know, for quick pouring. That's what bars care about, big, big volume bars care about. But also, they reduce the weight. So from 7,444 grams down to 520. And then we found a UK manufacturer that could bring it on one lorry from the glass factory in Leeds straight to the distillery, right? Mileage down as well. So then you can see the impact, right? The, the transport is massive. Uh, and then the overall impact takes us down to 49. So a reduction in the bottle, you know, nearly 50% change, and then the transport is even bigger. And obviously the total reduction is around 50% of the CO2 emissions. Right? That's how we approach it. That's an easy win. We've got a better looking bottle, it's less distance, and it's less glass. Now, flip across to the aluminium bottles I uh, put up earlier. So the aluminium bottles I was talking about are brand new to the market, right? No one else produces these, uh, and certainly not airlines. And EasyJet have jumped on it, and it's the reason we got the contract with them. EasyJet is an airline that I had no idea that their customer, that they consider their customer, is like a Waitrose shopper, right? In terms of the airline market. And then they, I think Ryanair sits with kind of your Aldi shopper. That's how the airline market thinks about things, which means Ryanair is probably never going to be a two drifters customer, but EasyJet, oh, we're also targeting weight trains. Um, so the aluminium side of it is about reducing the weight, right? But let's think about the carbon footprint. These ones, this particular uh, miniature, these are the ones on British Airways at the moment. So. Here is the same glass manufacturer in Leeds, uh, so the distance is the same, but the grammage per bottle, 85 grams um, for a glass bottle miniature, and it's 132 grams of uh, CO2 per miniature. It's big, it's big carbon footprint, right? It's heavy glass. Aluminium bottle weighs only 10 grams, right? So the weight of the actual aluminium is dramatically less. However, in order to get post-consumer recycled aluminium, which is what we hope we have, I have not verified that, so I'll explain that in a sec. It comes from Germany, and so the distance traveled is much greater. Then comes the difficult bit about aluminium. So aluminium, uh, we make the assumption that it's virgin aluminium that we're using. It's difficult to assume anything else because 100% recycled aluminium has a mixed definition, even in the EU at the moment, in that you can make, take your virgin aluminium, make a bottle and a load of offcuts here can be collected up and classed as recycled aluminium because that was recycled from waste. But really that's just more virgin aluminium that's being used in its carbon footprint. So there's an ongoing debate about aluminium recycling. And so because of that uncertainty, we'll put the worst case scenario in for now until we know better. That means that you've got Virgin aluminium, which is horrendous, if you look at the difference, bear in mind the weight, right? The difference in footprint of uh, aluminium is, is, uh, versus glass is massive, and the transport is less because it's lighter, even though it travels for further distance. So although you get a reduction in transport because of that, you get a big difference in the bottle. And so actually the emissions increase switching from glass to aluminium, a little bit surprising. Right? You would think this 10 gram little aluminium bottle should be genius, but not yet. What about the use phase though? We include the use phase in our carbon footprint, so we've really got to consider it. And on an aeroplane, if you're flying a bottle around, you know, we make the assumption we have three bottles on every plane that goes. So our British Airways contract 
That's 600 planes because we cover just the European ones. For the EasyJet one, we have a trial going on with just 30 planes, right? So it's a lot less to have to calculate for this year. If we roll out, which I really hope we do, once we're a massive success and everyone who's flying EasyJet this year should be buying two drifters. <laughs> <laughs> if that all goes ahead, then we roll out 170 planes, we've got to reassess. So that iteration you're talking about is always it's ongoing. We do it annually. So we recalculate every year. Okay, so the use phase. Well, we know that the weight of the glass bottle is much heavier than the weight of the aluminium. We also know that the manufacturing gives us this. So we know the footprint is that, but a short haul flight per ton, kilometers of travel, which is how you work out short haul flights. And we know we're only in the EU, so that's all we're doing, short haul. It's 20, 252 grams of CO2 for every ton you carry one kilometer. <laughs> not very far. Um, the CO2 emissions for the aluminium bottle is then this ridiculously small number, and the CO2 emissions for a glass bottle is an equally ridiculously small number that doesn't mean very much. So, on an E, so the, when I put this data up, I was giving a talk in Pisa because we were launching in Italy, which is why it's e Bristol to Pisa or London to Pisa, sorry. But basically, the reduction from switching glass to uh, from glass to aluminium when you're on the use phase, when you're flying it, because of the weight reduction, is 89%. So even though it's a bit more to make it, it's worth it in the use phase because you're flying around all the time, and actually that's a much bigger impact for that particular product. Now, the thing I don't like about aluminium bottles, and the reason why we wouldn't switch to it on land, or on areas where we can decarbonize the transport, is it has a plastic liner. Every single aluminium can has a plastic liner, and always your products touching plastic, and that is just isn't ideal. So it's something we would rather move away from, but here, hard to decarbonize aircraft, more essential to reduce your carbon footprint. And you know, it's it's like kilos of CO2 that you can say per person that they're saving, you know, if they weren't on that plane. So it's a, it's a huge impact that it has. And if you drink our rum versus another, you save a lot of CO2, especially if you're up in the air. So just bear that in mind when you're <laughs> anyway, the other things we think about the rest of the package, and I, uh, I promise I'm coming to the end now, uh, is the is the rest of it. You know, the, the sustainable uh, natural cork. So it's um, Portuguese pork, uh, cork with a wooden top. Uh, you have compostable tampa seal on our bottles, so it looks like plastic, but it's actually cellulose. Um, the glass bottle is, of course, lightweight and British. The paper is made from that milling process, so the leftover from the milling of the sugar, that's what the labels are printed on. Uh, and then of course you have our carbon negative rum inside uh, that's absolutely delicious, look good, do good. And as a distillery, we have so far paid Climeworks to remove 35.932 tonnes of CO2. Much, much, much more importantly, we've avoided 171 tonnes through all of our actions at the distillery. There's loads of stuff I didn't cover off, but um, lots of little things that you do throughout your entire process bring down the footprint quite dramatically. So therefore it's the all good run. And that's me, happy to take any questions. Excellent. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> I presume that there's a commercial advantage as well with the aluminium, because if I'm an aircraft operator, wait, it must be key. So big, yeah, big difference. But there's also nothing to stop the other guys sticking their product into it. So right. for now, we have the advantage because we, you know, early adopters of it. But yeah, yeah. Um, the rest will catch up, I'm sure. So then, how do you how do you convey this to the to the consumer? <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> so by picking off the shelf in Waitrose in, in a year's time or whatever, yeah. is it on the back of the bottle? Is it? Uh, so on the bottle itself. Um, I wonder if you can see any of the details. So down here, we have, so far, the distillery has removed so many okay. times, right? And that changes every time we update the labels. Um, we, on the back, have information that links to follow our story, and then it, it goes off to somewhere else. We do not hammer it home on the bottle other than the carbon negative rum statement, which may be a mistake, actually, and is a constant conversation between us, our sales team, and everyone else. But uh, we have a B Corp status, so this logo sits on the um, 
sits on the bottle, and it, I don't know if you're familiar, I guess, I guess you are, um, B Corp, you're able to go in and look at, at our ratings on there as well. Um, yeah, we are still trying to decide how best to package it and whether to put a carbon statement on there, since it varies so quickly, <laughs> because you're doing it every year, you know, you have to commit to buying so many labels to get a sensible price, so it's kind of commercial. Yeah. boring decision as to not put it on there because you have to constantly update it um we have a calculator a kind of a, what am i trying to say a, a counter yeah. that tells you what's ticking by on the website uh, and then the social media channels are kind of where you promote it but not specifically on the package which hopefully keeps us out of trouble <laughs> but, use one of these <laughs> one of these yeah. qr code yes exactly uh, and we've long talked about it although there's an argument as to whether it should be sustainability or sounds of the distillery or something something cool <laughs> <laughs> you've got a balance you know who to please and also you've got to remember that are you selling to just someone that's conscious about their carbon footprint which is a lot less people than, than people drink who drink, drink rum it's a difficult balance yeah. to so are you finding then the carbon neutral message is better for the corporate market than the individual buyer? It's better for the buyer of an organisation, yes, absolutely. It is usually the ones, so we see a lot of, a lot of our sales come from um, on trade, so bars, restaurants, hotels, and there you've got a central buyer that deals with, I don't know, 30 or 40 sites, cosy clubs are a good example, we stop there. Um, we... We then talk to their central buyer who wants to have a sustainable option on the menu. And then you say, right, well, which run are you looking at if you're not looking at us? And then very quickly it becomes apparent that they should choose us. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's usually how that works. Great. Brilliant. Well, thank you for bringing it all alive and, yeah, by just knitting it all together at the end. Yeah, no, no, nice story. <laughs> Brilliant, well, 